Well, hello again, Grace Community Church and all of our visitors, and welcome to our online service. We're going to start this time uh, with worshipping God in song, uh, and then Gary and Tope in turn will lead us in prayer. Uh, there will then be an item for the children, that's a, a new thing for this week, from the jam team, and then Sharon will bring us the notices. Then after a brief uh, introduction from me, Shamila and Helen will read uh, a passage from the Bible from Exodus chapter 12, after which I'm going to preach on that passage. So, we have two songs, let's worship God. Calvary, where 
Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance Loving Father, we thank you for your endless love, a love that never ceases and never ends. It spans time, generations, crosses continents, and even millennia. A love that flows continuously like the great river Nile. Nothing can stop your love healing our minds and hearts, shining a light on our souls and purifying our spirit, even lighting the darkest corner of our society when called upon until it just glistens like the most sparkling of rare diamonds. At this time of national and international crisis, we as a church body pray that your will be done against the COVID-19 virus. We pray for the NHS, all key workers, nursing homes and our leaders, whether great or small, that have all joined together in a spirit of unity to fight against the virus for the greater good of our society. A society that has so obviously been under such great strain that has been shaken to the very core of its foundations. One that at times has felt like it has been built on sand. But you, Lord, provide the glue that holds everything together. Lord, you have so obviously been there 
with us right the way through the crisis. We praise you for that. We pray for all those that are sick and bereaved or suffering from mental illness, asking you, Father, to bring that peace and healing that only you can provide at such difficult times. We thank you, Lord, for that spirit of national unity when we so obviously had to fight the awful tyranny during two world wars. A spirit has returned to our shores with neighbour looking out for neighbour in an act of great love and sometimes even great loss and sacrifice. We praise you, Lord, for all the fresh and innovative ways that we have been able to keep in touch as a church body, for your spirit moving like a bullet train through our social media platforms, converting all the lost and broken souls to your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit, that has always been there for us in our greatest hour of need, that spirit that has reached out to believers and unbelievers alike, not discriminating in any way, but providing a comfort blanket to a much needed broken world. We pray for all our church members and our church leaders to thank them for their hard work and dedication during this crisis. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for dying for us in such a horrendous way on that cross of Calvary for your forgiveness and that wonderful hope of eternal life. I want to finish by quoting one of my favourite pieces of scripture from St Paul's first letter to Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 4 to 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not boastful or envious or arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Amen. Father, we thank you for your seed of love that is in us. We call to mind the racial tensions that is in our world today and the activities of the Black Lives Matter movement. We acknowledge that in you there is no Jews nor Gentiles, no racial lines and no divisions. Lord, we ask that in your love, you will bring a release to parents, children, uncles, aunties, cousins, nieces and nephews that are held bound by, by the pain and sorrows of losses caused by racial injustices. Lift them out of it and give them peace. Father, we lift up to you individuals and groups that has become weary, tired, angry and frustrated as a result of being knocked down oppressed, suppressed, demeaned, ridiculed, aggressed, depreciated, and robbed of self-worth and progress in life, both physically, emotionally, and psychologically, well, be it on the streets, in their neighborhood, by individuals or organizations, and by the civil institutions because of their races. Lord Jesus, Heal them completely, remove scars, and make them whole again. Father, we earnestly pray for more and more of your love, love that will foster understanding in and across all our communities and build unity in our nation and our world. Bless our world with the true love that is found in you so that our nation will be a place where we all can live, grow, aspire, and attain to our full potentials together. Father, bind us all together with your bond of love that cannot be broken and make us one in spirit and in truth. Amen. Hello, welcome everybody. Every week we're going to have a little session for the children who are in jam. So we especially welcome you children and Today we're going to be looking at the story of Passover when God let the Israelites go free when they were slaves in the land of Egypt and comparing that to how today because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross we can know freedom and be free. God sent Moses to speak to Pharaoh to ask him to let the Israelites go free from slavery. Pharaoh, God says, let my people go. No, I will not let you and your people go. 
God turned the river into blood and sent many plagues. The Israelites sacrificed a lamb and put the blood of the lamb on the door. This protected them. Moses kept asking Pharaoh to let the people go. Pharaoh, God says, let my people go. Once again, I will not let you and your people go. Finally, God caused all the, born, the firstborn to die, but not the Israelites. Then Moses went to Pharaoh again. Pharaoh. God says, let my people go. Fine, I will let you and your people go and worship your Lord as you are. Leave! Israelites, we are free to go. We can leave Egypt. Come. Hooray! The time of Passover was the time God set his people free. And we can compare that to Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, who died on the cross and enabled us to know freedom because he forgives us of our sins. Phil is going to preach to you about this story. And we thought it would be a good idea while he's preaching if the children in Jam drew a picture of this story. And um, if you are able to forward the picture by email to Matthew, who will then forward it to the jam leaders who are leading next week's session and they'll show them to the rest of the church. Enjoy doing your pictures, children, and you'll hear from other jam leaders next week. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be back doing the notices with you today. Uh, there aren't very many notices, but uh, I am lucky enough to introduce you to the gig challenge. So everyone's been sending in their photos of something that makes them smile this week. And uh, a slideshow has been put together for you, and we're going to watch that now. Thank you Karen and Gig for this challenge um, thank you Connor for putting the, a really good slideshow together and thank you to everyone else who sent in your photos it was really lovely to watch this morning's special offering is for Zimbabwe so please give generously I hope to see you all soon keep praying keep praising God because he is so good in these times and love to you all and see you again soon bye Well, thank you, Sharon. 
As John said last week, we feel that now is the right time to pick up again on the uh, series on freedom that we began briefly before the lockdown kicked in. The Father in Heaven still wants his people to be free. He wants them to be free from sin, uh, free from the power of sin, free from Satan, uh, free from the effects of sin, and free to know him and to love him and to find their calling and identity in him as his people and for his kingdom. And we're exploring this issue of freedom through the book of Exodus, uh, which tells us how the Lord God set his ancient people, the Israelites, free from slavery in Egypt. And then having set them free, he brought them to himself and uh, confirmed himself in relationship with them, uh, confirmed their identity as his people, and gave them law so that they would know how to live for him as their king. And although those events took place uh, thousands of years ago, its message is still relevant for us today. Exodus is a prophetic picture of the freedom which Christ would bring to his present day people. And so each session we will also uh, think about how Exodus relates to the gospel. So let me remind you briefly of the background and the story so far. Abraham had received promises from God, received great promises from God, promises of a covenant relationship with himself, promises that his descendants would uh, become a great nation, would have a land of their own and would go on to be a blessing to the world. A bit later on to escape a famine, his grandson Jacob and great-grandchildren uh, went to Egypt and for a while they were safe there. But as they grew, the Egyptians became fearful of them and eventually they decided to make the Israelites into slaves. They were horribly oppressed. They were robbed not only of their freedom, but they were put to hard labor um, and treated really very brutally. And at one time, the Egyptians, wanting to control their population, decided to uh, put to death every newborn male child. But the Lord knew and promised to act to set his people free. And so the earlier chapters of Exodus describe how God commissioned Moses to confront Pharaoh and demand his people's freedom. Pharaoh refused. Who's the Lord, he said, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? For a while there was a standoff between Moses and Pharaoh. Moses would ask on God's behalf for the people's freedom and Pharaoh would refuse. And God would send a plague to warn Pharaoh. And Moses would ask again. And Pharaoh would refuse again. And so it went on and on and on. Until finally it reached a climax when God acted decisively once and for all to set his people free. This event is known as the Passover. And Shamila and Helen are going to read the relevant passage to us. The reading is from Exodus chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb, according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbour shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, and he shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and in the intel of the houses in which they eat it in this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. 
for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Then the people of Israel went and did so as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who is in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be God, and bless me also. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses had told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewellery and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favour in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Thank you, Shamila and Helen. So this was the first Passover and it's been celebrated by Jewish people ever since. And it was an incredibly significant and dramatic moment. Just after the sun had set, as God had commanded, lambs were slaughtered and their blood was painted on the Israelites' door frames. The Israelites ate, got ready to run and waited. Then in the darkness of midnight, Death came to the Egyptians, the final plague. But a distinction was made. Every household that had the lamb's blood painted on their doorframe was spared. Death passed over them, which is why it's called Passover. And suddenly, Pharaoh and the Egyptians, who had been so determined to hang on to them, couldn't wait to get rid of God's people. In fact, they were so keen to get rid of them, they even paid them to leave. And so as the Lord God had promised, he set his people free. Free to go to him, free to serve him, and free to fulfill their destiny as his people. It was a great moment. Pharaoh had asked his infamous question, who is the Lord that I should obey him? Well, now he knew. Now he had some idea of who the Lord was, or at least he should have. All through the plagues, God had been showing Pharaoh who he was. He'd been demonstrating his control over nature and his power over the so-called gods of Egypt. Many of the plagues were aimed directly at things the Egyptians worshipped. Pharaoh should have learned by then that the Lord is creator and the one true living God. And now his final lesson was that the Lord is just and the judge of all. The Israelites had been enslaved for generations by this time. For hundreds of years they'd been dehumanised, subjected to brutality and even suffered the murder of their children. Now though, God's court was in session. The Egyptians had been called to account for the wrongs they'd done and sentence was passed. Pharaoh found in that moment that the Lord is one who cares about the suffering and injustice that the powerful inflict on the weak. That he's for the poor and the oppressed and he will not tolerate injustice forever. The punishment inflicted on the Egyptians may seem severe to us, but it was just. In fact, it was much less than the suffering the Egyptians had inflicted on the Israelites over hundreds of years. There was mercy in judgment. And it only came after God's offer of full mercy was rejected several times over. Pharaoh could have let the Israelites go at the first opportunity. 
Instead, he stubbornly hung on to what he had, resisting that offer of mercy until it was too late, until there was no option left but for God to bring judgment. And so God judged Pharaoh and the Egyptians for their sins. Sin is the Bible word that describes all those injustices and the cruelty that Pharaoh and the Egyptians visited on the Israelites. Actually, it's God's word for everything that we do wrong. And Pharaoh would also have learned at this point that the Lord is committed to his own people, to the ones that he's brought into relationship with himself. They may be led through periods of waiting and suffering, but he will at the right time fulfill all his promises. And they'll be compensated for their suffering, just as the Israelites were compensated by the Egyptians as they planted them. But there was an issue that God needed to attend to first before he could set his Israelites free. The Lord is a God of justice. And justice demands that it should be strictly impartial. A God who's just cannot show favoritism, even to his own people. The problem was that the Israelites were just as much sinners as were the Egyptians. We don't see it specifically in this passage, but if we were to look a bit at their earlier history, or if we were to continue reading on through the Bible, through Exodus and the rest of the Bible, it becomes all too clear just how sinful they were. There's no one who's without sin. Being a victim isn't the same thing as being innocent. And justice required that the Israelites should have been just as liable for judgment for their sins as were the Egyptians. So there was an apparent dilemma. The Lord had set his love on the Israelites, brought them into covenant relationship with himself, had promised them great things and promised to set them free from their oppressors. But they were just as deserving of judgment as were those who oppressed them. A way was needed somehow for God to execute impartial judgment and at the same time fulfill all his promises to his people. And so in the plan of God, a substitute was provided. Judgment meant death. For the Egyptians, it meant death of their firstborn. For the Israelites, it also meant death. It meant the death of a young, unblemished lamb. The unblemished lamb stood in for their firstborn, was substituted for them. And so it was that when death came, wherever he saw the blood of the lamb, he passed over that house and the Israelites were saved. The Israelites were saved from judgment and from death, not because they were innocent or because they'd done wonderful good works or because they were victims, but simply because they took shelter behind the blood of the lamb. The one thing that stood between them and certain death for their sins was a sacrificed lamb. All that was required of them was the obedience of faith. Faith that God would accept that sacrificed lamb in their stead. And he did. God had provided a way in which the demands of love and justice were both met in that moment. And in that moment, the Israelite slaves were set free. When God's judgment came, when his power was unleashed on the Egyptians, they knew at last that the game was up, that God had come, that they were defeated and could no longer keep their Israelites as slaves. They had to let them go. From that moment on, the Israelites were free, no longer possessions merely of the Egyptians, no longer subject to forced labor and brutality, no longer strips of their dignity and worth, no longer living in fear. And they were free from God's just judgment. Those two things went together. They were set free from bondage and from judgment to go and live out their destiny as God's people, to inherit all the great promises the Lord God had made to Abraham. So let's sum up what we've learned so far through the Exodus story. The Lord God is the creator, the one true God and the just judge of all. He offers mercy, but judgment will come in the end if it's not received. And although his own people were just as liable for judgment as the Egyptians, 
He provided a way of escape through the blood of an unblemished lamb. Their part was simply the obedience of faith. And so God freed the Israelites from both bondage and judgment and liberated them to fulfill their destiny as his people. Now let's fast forward maybe 1400 years or so to another Passover. And again it's dark, it's dark as midnight, but this is a strange darkness. This is a darkness that's come over the land in the middle of the day. And again there's a death and there's blood running down a wooden post. But this is not the death of a lamb, the blood of a young sheep or a young goat. It's the death and the blood of a young man. A young man who's been crucified by the authorities. We know him as Jesus Christ. He's not just any young man and it's not just any ordinary execution. Three years earlier, John the Baptist had pointed Jesus out to a crowd and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Writing some years later, the Apostle Paul referred to the crucified one as Christ, our Passover Lamb. And the Apostle Peter also likened him to a lamb without blemish or spot. A few minutes ago I said that the events of Exodus were a prophetic picture of the freedom which Christ has won for his present day people. Those events picture for us the freedom which has been made available to us through Jesus Christ crucified and risen again. For those who receive it there is freedom, freedom from bondage, freedom from judgment to be found through Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, through his death and resurrection. To make sense of that statement, we need to know who Jesus is, what kind of bondage we're talking about, why we are liable to judgment, how Christ sets us free, and how we're to receive it. So firstly, who is Jesus? The lambs that were to be sacrificed at that first Passover had to be without blemish. In the original language, that's just one word, and it means perfect. In other contexts, it could be translated as blameless. So when the apostles describe Jesus as our Passover lamb without spot or blemish, we're to understand that he was perfect, blameless. Now that doesn't describe anyone I know, and it certainly doesn't describe me. But Jesus Christ, having lived 30 plus years, having grown up in a normal family, having gone to work in an ordinary job with ordinary people, having endured misunderstanding and rejection and betrayal and injustice and torture, at the end of it all, and despite it all, could be described as perfect and blameless. In other words, without sin. And that's extraordinary, and that requires an explanation. The Gospels tell us that Jesus was conceived in Mary's womb without a human father when God's Holy Spirit came on her. They tell us that before he was born, before he was conceived even, he was with God and was God, and that everything that exists was made through him. In other words, Jesus Christ, son of Mary, carpenter, teacher, healer, the crucified and risen one is also the eternal creator, son of God. He is fully human and fully God. As a human being, he lived a life just like ours. But as God, he was not prone to sin as we are. Throughout his earthly life, he was entirely free from sin. And so he went to the cross, perfect and blameless, without a spot or blemish on his character. So that's who Jesus is, the Lord God come to us, sharing our humanity to be our perfect, spotless Passover lamb. And that leads us to the second thing. What kind of bondage are we talking about? What is it that we need Jesus to set us free from? The Bible talks about sin in various ways. It is, of course, all the things we do wrong, all the ways we break God's good laws, 
the ways we rebel against his person and his authority. But the Bible also describes sin as a power which controls us. None of us live up to our good intentions. How many times has someone turned over a a new leaf only to find that it's just the other side of the old leaf? How many times do we say that we're sorry and mean it only to go on and do the same thing again and again? The Apostle Paul, writing about his life before he became a Christian, said this. He said, I don't understand my own actions. For I don't do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. He said, I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. He loved God's law and tried his very hardest to honour God with his obedience. And although he felt he'd made progress beyond his contemporaries, he found that there was a greater power even than his own determination that he was not able to overcome, so that he was never able to be fully obedient. He found sin to be a power within himself, part of himself, but beyond his ability to master. He had no more power to resist it than the Israelites were able to resist their Egyptian taskmasters. He was in bondage to sin. And so, without Christ, are all of us. Jesus himself tells us that to sin is to be a slave to sin. And sin means we're guilty. Not just generously, amorphously guilty, but guilty before God. Guilty before God's justice. And the guilt of our sin makes it impossible for us to have a relationship with our Holy Creator. But that's not all. There is a higher level of bondage to which people are also subject. The Bible tells us that there is a spiritual power of evil at work in the world which operates both on an individual and a structural and a cultural level. It opposes God. It promotes sin. It stands behind injustice and inequalities and oppression as well as individual acts of moral madness. The Bible puts a name to this spiritual evil, Satan. Jesus called him the prince of this world. Our sin and our guilt give him power over us and authority over us. And like Pharaoh, he is determined not to let us go. Now, of course, many people would scoff at the idea of sin or Satan, but they're in the news every day. And sin is no laughing matter. Sin hurts people. It hurts people at every level. It hurts them at a structural and a cultural level as well as an individual level. Whether it's racial injustice, such as we've seen in the news recently, or economic injustice, or broken relationships, or just plain selfishness, people are damaged by sin in a multitude of ways. They're damaged spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and socially. It hurts people today just as much as it hurt the ancient Israelites who, through the Egyptian sin, were robbed of their human worth and dignity. So we're in bondage to sin, and sin puts us in bondage to guilt, and it separates us from God, and Satan holds us there, and it hurts And God is a God of justice, necessarily impartial. He does not, cannot show favoritism. Judgment will come at the end of the day, just as certainly as it came at midnight to the Egyptians. And it will come equally to all, because all alike are guilty. For there is no distinction, the New Testament tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All means all. No exceptions. And just as all have sinned, so all must be liable for judgment for their sinning. The good news is God has a plan. In love he's provided a way of escape. He's provided a way to set people free, to become his people. Free from sin. Free from the guilt of sin. Free from the power of sin. Free from Satan. Free from the hurts of sin. And free from judgment he's provided a way of escape from bondage and judgment 
in which the demands of his love for people and the necessity of justice are both perfectly met. His plan was put into action 2,000 years ago. It's Christ, our Passover lamb. Jesus went to his death on that cross without blemish or spot on his character. If he'd had any sin in himself, he could never have been our Passover lamb. But as it was, his perfect life was given up in place of our imperfect lives. In his death, Christ stood in our stead, took our place in the judgment, just as the Exodus lambs took their place in judgment for the Israelites. All that's required of us now is the obedience of faith, to take shelter behind the blood of Christ, to hide behind his death. If we will put our faith in Christ's death as taking our place in the judgment, then in the judgment of God, he will pass over us. In fact, for those who've put their faith in Christ, the judgment has already passed over us. Final judgment has already taken place. As we shelter in Christ, we are freed from judgment. Our sin is no longer counted against us. The chains of our guilt fall away and we are made acceptable to God as if we'd never sinned at all in the first place. We're free to approach him, free to know him, free in fact to call him our father. And it doesn't stop there. Those ancient Israelites, they didn't just escape judgment, they left Egypt, they escaped. Pharaoh and their taskmasters, they left their life of slavery far behind them forever. And they went with plunder, they went with provisions for their lives. And for us, as we find shelter in Jesus, we not only find freedom from guilt and judgment, but our bondage to sin and Satan is ended. Sin is a power from which it's humanly impossible to escape, but only humanly impossible. Now we no longer face our weaknesses and our temptations alone. Christ, who never sinned, lives in us by his Spirit to change us and to empower us and to fright for us, so that his freedom from sin becomes our freedom from sin. Christ crucified is our victory. As for Satan, our guilt placed us under bondage to him, under his authority. But when our guilt was taken away, his right to a claim to us was taken away too. He has no more claim on us. And those who belong to Jesus have been given God's authority to resist him. As for the hurts of sin, for the damage done in our lives by sins of our own and sins of others, our Heavenly Father tends to us. His Spirit nurses us back to health, heals our wounds and makes us whole. He releases us from things that have bound us up to live life in his kingdom as his children. That's been my experience over these past 48 years. So summing up this second half, all people by nature are enslaved by sin and are in bondage to guilt. Satan has control over them and we're all liable to God's just judgment. But God, in love, gave his blameless son, Jesus Christ, to be our perfect Passover lamb, to die in our stead, to free us from judgment and from the guilt of sin, from the power of sin, and the authority of Satan to restore us to God. Our part is simply the obedience of faith, to put ourselves under Christ's protection. And those who do receive his gift of freedom get to call God Father, and to know his healing and provision in their lives. We're set free to live for him and to find our true identity and destiny. So church, this freedom is our Heavenly Father's gift to us, our spiritual birthright bought for us by the blood of his precious, blameless Son. So let's press in to know it more and more. Let's really go for it. Let's not settle for anything less. And if you're watching this and you're not someone who regularly goes to church, someone maybe who doesn't know Jesus for themselves, what will you do with Jesus? 
What will you do in response to this offer that God holds out to you of freedom? You could, of course, be like Pharaoh and hold out against his mercy. But it won't end well. Or you could take refuge in Jesus and find the freedom that God has for you. God longs for you to know his freedom. He has paid an incalculable price in the death of his son for you to receive it. The freedom that the world values, the freedom to do as you please, is simply the freedom to sin, the freedom to hurt and to be hurt. It's the ultimate fake news. True freedom is freedom to be free from sin and free for God. So how will you respond? If you're ready to receive God's freedom, freedom from sin, freedom from guilt, freedom from judgment, freedom to live for God, the freedom that comes from the sacrifice of Jesus alone, you might want to pray something along these lines. Father God, I acknowledge that I have sinned against you. I have lived independently of you. I've done things which I should not have done and have not done things which I should have done. I thank you that you gave your perfect, blameless Son, Jesus Christ, to die in my place so that I might be forgiven and set free. I now put my trust in his sacrifice and I ask you to accept me for his sake as I now turn from my old way of life to follow him and live for you. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, we'd love to hear from you. Please do get in touch. There will be some details on the screen and they're also on our website. So we're going to finish now with a final time of worship, with a final hymn to celebrate all that our great saving God has done for us. Say
May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Amen.